I'm sorry, not happy. I didn't feel like I was like a vibrant version of myself. I felt stifled. In the morning, I would say, like, when my brain is the most wild. And so I go on a walk, and oftentimes, like, anxious thoughts will pop up. And the first thing I do is just practice thought diffusion. Whether it be picturing those thoughts as I do, like, leaves in a river, or it could be questioning the thoughts and trying to accumulate evidence to build up, like, is it real, is it not? And I always set little goals for myself based on kind of how I start my day. It's like, okay, well, this is how I'm feeling. And like my goal is to carry on despite this stress, despite this thing, despite this like maybe impending problem in the business that's stressing me out. And I want to do this to get through the day without giving it any more attention. I'll acknowledge the problem when it comes up. I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm able to say, oh wow, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. But yeah, that's pretty stressful. But you know what? I'm not going to do anything about that. You know, something I like to think myself is I like to say that's just spam. I'm like, dang, I got a lot of spam today. It's like, you know when you open your email and it's like you have a ton of spam, you're like, oh my god. Like, I thought these were important emails, but they're not. I think that was my thought. Unuseful, unstructured thought. And some days I really want to act on them, but I don't because the question I ask myself is, do I want more food thoughts or less of them? Or if I want less of them, then I won't act on them. And now there are thoughts that are valid, meaning like there is evidence to support them. And so I think that the way that you differentiate is just to ask yourself, like, what evidence supports the discipline? Acting on our thoughts and emotions like they are facts and directives has led to so many people hating work, you know, because they are in this environment where it's perpetually fueled by anxiety and stress and fear. I genuinely really love working. And I think people often see me and Alex and they think, gosh, they must be miserable working all the time, like robots. I'm like, I love what I do. I don't feel like a ball of stress every day. I think that the only way that you can get there is to break the link between thought to action. I think if you want to break the link between thought and action, the first step is accepting that you don't control your thoughts. You realize that everybody has crazy, weird, fucked up, scary, anxious thoughts. You don't even feel anything about them. They can exist and you can exist in the world simultaneously. You can have terrible thoughts and you can also show up today and report on or run a company. The more that you can accept them, the more that they don't stress you out. Don't try to find the meaning behind it. Not trying to figure out why did I have that thought. Like the moment that you try to make sense of the brain, that's when you're getting too caught up. So it's acknowledging the thought, making yourself aware of the thought, and then saying, you know what? Cool, maybe today I've got a ton of fucked up thoughts. I'm gonna go on with my day anyway. The second piece to it is how can we have fun? I think that's just how can you change your perspective? The thought does not dictate behavior. You can have a thought and then go do something else. So a great practice for this is go walk in a circle and then tell yourself you can't walk in a circle. Keep walking in a circle and keep telling yourself you can't. Oh my god, you can think something and do the opposite. You can have a thought. What if I shit my pants when I get that seat? And you can still go get that seat. And often what you'll find is thought for things to learn. And so I think that that's really the second step is teaching yourself that thoughts do not need to equate to action. And that way you'll see over time is the more time that you take action that is opposite of the thought, the less the thought will occur. If I have daily stressors that are popping up, which in business, I think you get new ones left and right, and I'm constantly acting on them, I would just turn to a paranoid freak, you know what I mean? And I think at one point in my early career, like, I was almost pretty great. I was like, I gotta, you know, walk and tackle it, make sure nothing kills the company, right? And what I realized was I was just reinforcing this fear-mongering mindset by taking action on those fearful thoughts. Oftentimes, solving problems rewards us in some ways. But when the problems are thinking problems, not practical problems, then we just chase ourselves in circles. A lot of people try to control their thoughts by changing their environment, changing their circumstances. And the reality is, if you just don't try to control your thoughts and don't try to engage in them, allow them to be there, acknowledge them, accept that they exist, they will go away mentally. Unfortunately, a lot of people, and it, it turns out in business, they don't do that. And so then they act on it. And then they just create this life of chaos where they just have so many open loops that they have to close because they're constantly trying to solve problems that don't exist. And you see a lot in business of people who get really paranoid and they're 
constantly thinking, what if this happens, my business will go down? And so then they have to go do something about it. Like, well, what if that thought exists and you could do nothing about it? That's the case for so many things. It's like in relationships, a girl has a thought. She says, what if he's cheating? And then she says, you know what? Because I have that thought, I should go check his phone. And then what happens is now she feels better because she checked his phone and nothing was there. So what does she want to do the next time she has that thought? She wants to play the phone. So one day he does say, please keep her on the phone. And you think, you're not so Oftentimes, the behavior leads to more problems than it solves. It solves for a thinking problem, not a practical problem. And so, if we can separate ourselves and say, is this a thinking problem or is it a practical problem? A really helpful way to separate yourself from the problem is just to think of them as outside yourself. And so, like a lot of practices that allow this are to think of them like something else that we are familiar with. One example could be like cars passing by a street. You think of your thought as that. Another way I look at it is like fish in a pond. Even Joe saying it'd be like the soil ones, like the shitty thoughts and just like who knows. I think all of those things are helpful exercises mentally. It's not like you need to like forever detached. I don't think that that's a good thing. It's like you just get past for like a month of time that you can then do the thing that you say you're going to do. That you can do the thing that scares you, that you can do the thing that stresses you out, that you can move forward with your day, that you can get out of bed. Whatever it is, I think that it's just giving yourself a next step that you can take the first step. You're going to feel stressed no matter what. If you're in a situation that you don't like and you're stressed about it, you're going to remain stressed if you don't do anything. If you try to change, you will also feel stressed. Only in one scenario does the stress also move you forward. And in my opinion, the stress of change will take any day to the stress of remaining the same and fearing what my life may look like if I don't change. For me, it's very freeing to have the realization when I'm feeling very stressed and maybe I feel stuck in a decision. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know what? I will feel just as stressed making a change. Only one of them is going to drive me forward. And so it's a great frame shift if you're trying to change, which is you already feel awful. You might as well feel awful and productive at the same time. Things are overwhelming sometimes. There's just no fighting. And I think it's always so much work if you don't want to accept that things are going to be overwhelming and stressful. Whereas I just feel like I eventually lean into it. I'm like, this is going to be stressful, overwhelming, not going to like it, not going to enjoy it. Will I be better for it? Will I learn things? Yes. I appreciate those times because I think a lot of the times where I've learned the most in my career have been the times where it's the hardest, where it feels shitty, where you feel like you just want to be freaking over. After a season of feeling stressful comes a season of relief, and then again, a season of stress. It's just like, I've just done this for too long to think that anything is permanent. You just always know that there's an end in sight to every season you're in. Try to make the most of the one you're in. look at traits of super high achievers, most of them start off highly anxious. God, I'd rather have that than not be able to get out of bed and not have anything worth living for. And I'm grateful that I think I care about so much that I stress out of them. A lot of people have nothing to do with When I first got into business, I felt anxious all the time and I think very successful but anxious and stressed and not happy. I didn't feel like I was like a vibrant version of myself. I felt stifled in a weird way. People underestimate how important it is as a leader of a company to be able to manage your stress. Trying to make sure everything is absolutely dialed perfectly at all times is unrealistic. And so it's like then we stress ourselves out over it and actually in stressing ourselves out act like a worse leader, act like a worse co-worker, we make worse decisions. For me, like when I have a lot going on, I think the most important thing is that I don't take it too seriously. Because if I do, I stress myself out more, I make poor decisions, I'm not a great leader, people don't have to tell me problems because they're worried about stressing me out more. So like, oh. In the morning, I would say, like, when my brain is the most wild. And so I go on a walk, and oftentimes, like, anxious thoughts will pop up. And the first thing I do is just practice thought diffusion, whether it be picturing those thoughts as I do like leaves in a river, or it could be questioning the thoughts and trying to accumulate evidence to build up like, is it real, is it not? And I always set little goals for myself based on kind of how I start my day. It's like, okay, well, this is how I'm feeling. Then like my goal is to carry on despite this stress, despite this thing, despite this like maybe impending problem in the business that's stressing me out and I want to do something about it, right? And I'm like, okay, my goal is just to get through the day without giving it any more attention. I'll acknowledge the thought when it comes up. I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm able to say, oh wow, that's a, 
not to be interesting at all. But yeah, that's pretty stressful. But you know what? I'm not going to do anything about that. You know, something I like to say to myself is I like to say, that's just spam. I'm like, dang, I got a lot of spam today. It's like, you know, you open your email and it's like you have a ton of spam. And you're like, oh my God. Like, I got thoughts of blue important emails, but they're not. I think that was my thought. Unuseful, unproductive thought. And some days I really want to ask someone, but I don't. Because the question I ask myself is, do I want more blue thoughts or less of them? Or if I want less of them, then I won't ask them. And now there are thoughts that are valid, meaning like there's evidence to support them. And so I think that the way we differentiate is just to ask yourself, like, what evidence supports this? Because acting on our thoughts and emotions like they are facts and directives has led to so many people hating work, you know, because they are in this environment where it's perpetually fueled by anxiety and stress and fear. I genuinely really love working. And I think people often see me and Alex and they think, gosh, they must be miserable working all the time, like robots. Like, I love what I do. I don't feel like a ball of stress every day. I think that the only way that you can get there is to break the link between thought to action. I think if you want to break the link between thought and action, the first step is accepting that you don't control your thoughts. You realize that everybody has crazy, weird, fucked up, scary, anxious thoughts. You don't even do anything. They can exist, and you can exist in the world simultaneously. You can have terrible thoughts, and you can also show up today and report time or run a company. The more that you can accept them, the more that they don't stress you out. Don't try to find the meaning behind it. Not trying to figure out why did I have that thought. Like, the moment that you try to make sense of the brain, that's when you're getting too caught up. So it's acknowledging the thought, making yourself aware of the thought, and then saying, you know what? Cool. Maybe today I've got a ton of fucked up thoughts. I'm going to go on with my day anyway. The second piece to it is how can you just pass on I think that's just how can you change your perspective on it? The thought does not dictate behavior. You can have a thought and then go do something else. So a great practice for this is go walk in a circle and then tell yourself you can't walk in a circle. Keep walking in a circle and keep telling yourself you can't. Oh my God, you can think something and do the opposite. You can have a thought. What if I shit my pants when I get that seat? And you can still go get that seat. And often what you'll find is thought for something else. And so I think that that's really the second step is teaching yourself that thoughts do not need to equate to action. And that what you'll see over time is the more time that you take action that is opposite of the thought, the less the thought will occur. If I have daily stressors that are popping up, which in business, I think you get new ones left and right, and I'm constantly acting on them, I would just turn to a paranoid freak, you know what I mean? And I think at one point in my early career, like I was almost a degree, I like, I gotta, you know, lock and tackle, like make sure nothing kills the company, right? And what I realized was I was just reinforcing this fear-mongering mindset by taking action on those fearful thoughts. Oftentimes, solving problems rewards us in some way. But when the problems are thinking problems, not practical problems, then we just chase ourselves in circles. A lot of people try to control their thoughts by changing their environment, changing their circumstances. And the reality is, if you just don't try to control your thoughts and don't try to engage them, allow them to be there, acknowledge them, accept that they exist, they will go away eventually. Unfortunately, a lot of people, and it, it turns out in business, they don't do that. And so then they act on it. And then they just create this life of chaos where they just have so many open loops that they have to close because they're constantly trying to solve problems that don't exist. And you see a lot in business of people who get really paranoid and they're constantly thinking, what if this happens? My business will burn down. And so then they have to go do something about it. I go, what if that thought could exist and you could do nothing about it? That's the case for so many things. It's like in relationships, a girl has a thought. She says, what if he's cheating? And then she says, you know what? Because I have that thought, I should go check his phone. And then what happens is now she feels better because she checked his phone and nothing was there. So what does she want to do the next time she has that thought? She wants to check his phone. One day he walks in and he's sees her on his phone. And he thinks, you know, so oftentimes the behavior leads to more problems than it solves for. It solves for a thinking problem not a practical problem. And so if we can separate ourselves and say, is this a thinking problem or is it a practical problem? A really helpful way to separate yourself from the thought is just to think of them as outside yourself. And so like a lot of practices that allow this are to think of them like something else that we are familiar with. One example could be like cars pass a ride as free. You think of your thought as that. Another way I look at it is like fish in a pond. They even joke that you'll see like the soil one, which is like the shitty thought you just start thinking about. I think all of those things are helpful exercises mentally to detach from your thoughts. It's not like you need to like forever detach. I don't think that that's a good goal. It's like you just detach for like a minute of time that you can then do the thing that you said you're going to do, that you can 
do think that there is a need, if you do feel like stress is you out, but you can move forward with your day, and you can get out of bed, whatever it is, I think that it's just giving yourself a chance that you can take the first step. You're going to feel stressed no matter what. If you're in a situation that you don't like and you're stressed about it, you're going to remain stressed if you don't do anything. If you try to change, you will also feel stressed. Only in one scenario does the stress also move you forward. And in my opinion, the stress of change, I would take any day to the stress of remaining the same and fearing what my life may look like if I don't do it. For me, it's very freeing to have the realization when I'm feeling very stressed and I'm stuck in a decision. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know what? I would feel just as stressed making a change. Only one of them. start off highly anxious. God, I'd rather have that than not be able to get out of bed and not have anything worth living for. And I'm grateful that I have things I care about so much that I stress out over them. Well, I do love nothing in front of Tom, you were at the restaurant that invented the first hamburger in 1900. Tom, you were at the restaurant that invented the first hamburger in 1900. Tom, you were at the restaurant that invented the first hamburger in 1900. This lady's gotta be a liar. She said you can make the best macaroni and cheese. 
there's a ladge on it, too. You shut the ladge. You shut the ladge. Look at that. Get off the access. We don't want no crust. Okay, no crust is a must. Look at that. We're all packed in like a Ron Jeremy video. Look at that. Now take this to your hot ass stove. Now, now, I don't know how long to put it on each side, so I mean, we're just gonna guesstimate. I think I'm gonna do two minutes each side. That's hot. That's two minutes each side. I'll okay, get like a referee before a football game. And Time for a great review. Are you ready for this? Da, 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 da. Oh, I managed to hold my hot dog. What? Oh, 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 are you ready for this? Da, 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 da. A little bit dark, all right? Of course, really and then two minutes each side might have been too long, but that's okay, because that looks, that looks. Yeah, here we go. One, two, three. Get in there. Oh, yes! That's what we wanted, people. That's what we wanted. That's what we wanted. Oh! Look at that cheese on the glizz. Look at the cheese. Okay, one. Two. Mm. This is so I'm making a peanut butter and jelly one now. I can't stop. It's like crack. I, I mean, I've never done crack, but I think it's like it. I don't know. This is the peanut butter and jelly one. Oh, I can see it already. Oh, oh, oh. Look at that little damn peanut butter and jelly pocket. Excuse me. You're a brown. 
it's not a very unique thing that I've done. It's a skin, it's a you know, uh, it's but it's very difficult. And a lady comes in and she says, just put my back in. No problem. It's like 422 pounds in a different color. In his mind, out of the corner of the camera, it breaks up to four different things. So now the doctor is going to use a proper Let me touch the that he tells me to Let's take blood of zero. Let's take a small line. Let me take a sample. Let's just wait for the doctor to tell me to Tell me I have this or I have this or I have this. But do not tell me. When do I have a question? I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going uh, stated income. You're trying to qualify for seven hundred twenty thousand dollar loan. How much money do you make last month? Well, it's three hundred forty thousand dollars. How much money do you make last year? Are you two hundred forty thousand? You want to get qualified for this one? Yeah. Okay. One more time. How much money do you get? <laughs> That's what it was. Right? 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 And this is right after Wamu, Countrywide, and all these other kinds of companies that are doing what they're doing. Very problematic in this situation. So then we saw cities like Riverside, Riverside County, 65% out of the world. Then you have loan modifications. Then you have people that were buying five, six, ten, ten years. And they get the amortization. If you got a loan, you get the program that can give them all failure. This is where the story always feels like that. You're still going to get out of the program. You're still going to get out of the program. It's meant to only be for people who are good. You got a $10 million loan on a house? You got $40 million in bank account? I'm going to be doing those. You got $400 million. You got the $60 million loan? You got the $30 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 million Okay. For example, for the average person in America, we're going to sound like this. Do it again. Make any payment of $400. Interest only was $1,800 a month. $30 of which was $3,100 a month. And $50 of which was $4,000 a month. Okay. So people are like, dude, buy another house. And another house. And enough. So now I got five houses that I'm paying $400 a month. I can't afford to do that. Except that we've only built two or three or five years. And then all of a sudden, your 400 payment is $4,400 times five hundred. How do you pay $20,000 a month? You can't do it. So, so that's what it is. So that's not the case study of today. The case study of today is somehow, some way, the government thought it could get out of this low piece of food to one to one. And we have 8% of the loan that we're going. And then we talk about 128 million dollars. By the way, if there's no COVID, that would have been 150 million dollars. That's not good. That was not good enough expenses because during that cycle that we went on, money was so cheap that people were just picking up money and buying stuff left and right. It was so cheap. Go get a house. Go get a car. Rates were low. You know, these big companies are getting 50 million dollar loans, 100 million dollar loans. Two hundred million dollar loan. Go get as much money as you can. Then COVID is. When COVID is, philosophically, it was a shit show. Go work from home. Eighteen months. That's what you gotta do. Essential, non-essential. 
And then when that took place, somebody like Twitter and many others said, I could have for the rest of your life. What a noble company. That's what we got to do. And then so we go through that cycle. And then people started sort of using employers and that two jobs.